People often say that RxJS is overcomplicated and that you don't really need it for everyday scenarios. But this has always confused me because like what are these people doing when they need to add virtual violins to their apps? Declarative RxJS code is where it's at for violins, and in all seriousness this is actually a fantastic use case for RxJS, and a great demonstration of some of RxJS's more advanced operators. Even if you have no interest in creating a virtual violin, you'll find the concepts here map quite well to more standard front-end dev tasks. The general idea with what I have created here is that you can use these keys to bow up and down on a particular string, and the rest of the keys in that row can be pressed to produce a particular note on that string. For example, I could start on the open A string and then move up the A major scale like this. Now somehow I'm actually worse at playing this virtual violin than a real one, so I just wrote some code to play a more interesting piece for you. So let's look at how to build this thing. There are all sorts of scenarios and edge cases here that make this more difficult and interesting than just checking what key is being pressed and producing a particular tone. But the first order of business is producing tones for the open strings. This happens when we just bow a string without pressing any notes. If I press the up or down bow button for the open A string, it should produce an A note. And if I hold down the bow button, it should sustain that note. The good news for this virtual violin is that you have an infinitely long bow and arms. You could just hold one continuous up bow forever. So we have our synth defined which will allow us to play whatever tone or combination of tones we like, and then we have a few things set up declaratively with RxJS streams. We have a stream that will emit the keyboard object when it is available, and then we have a pressed key stream that will switch from that keyboard object to a stream that merges key up and key down events coming from the keyboard. We map these streams so that we know whether a particular emission on this stream is a key up or key down event, and also specifically what key was pressed or released. So what we have at this point is a stream that emits whatever the last key to be pressed or released was. But what we ultimately want is for this stream to emit an array of all the keys currently being pressed. For example, if I press A and then S, then my array should contain both A and S. But then if I release A, the array should only contain S. We achieve this with the scan operator, which is somewhat similar to the reduce method on an array. The reduce method iterates through each element in the array and runs some function using the current element's value as well as the output from the previous iteration. And then we return whatever should be passed to the next iteration. In a sense, we reduce or combine all of the elements in the array into some other value. It is more or less the same with scan, except rather than working with elements in an array, we reduce each emission from the stream into some other value calculated from all of the emissions on the stream over time. Each time our pressed keys stream emits, we take the previous value that was returned from this scan the last time the stream emitted, which will be an empty array if this is the first time the stream has emitted, and then we add or remove the appropriate key from the array based on whatever the current key being pressed or released is. We return this array of keys so that the next time the stream emits, this new array is what will be passed in as the previous pressed keys. Note that distinct until changed is also required here because holding a key down will cause lots of key down events. So we need to make sure that we only emit on this stream when there is actually a change. If this stream emits the same value twice, the second one will be ignored. To make the resulting stream a bit easier to work with, rather than just returning an array of key codes currently being pressed, I map it to names that represent the action they are performing. For example, I am using the string BDE5 to represent a down bow on the E string, and AC5 to represent C sharp being pressed on the A string. So we've defined these things declaratively, but now we need to trigger an imperative side effect in response to what is being emitted on these streams. For any particular set of keys that are being pressed, the side effect is that our synth should play particular sounds. For now this is pretty easy as we are only worrying about producing a tone for the open strings, meaning a G, D, A or E string being played with no notes being held down on those strings. So what we can do is create a new up or down bow stream declaratively that takes the pressed keys stream and filters it just for those keys that represent an up or down bow on a particular string. Then we can subscribe to this stream, our imperative step, 
and use trigger attack on our synth to play the note for whatever string is currently being bowed. Trigger attack alone will sustain the note infinitely, so we also make sure to stop any notes being played every time this stream emits. This means that if you stop bowing, the note will also stop, or if you switch to a different string, that note will play instead. Now that the open strings work, we need to add in the ability to play specific notes on those strings. This adds more complexity to our problem. For example, I could play an F sharp on the E string by placing my finger here and bowing. But I can't just have the user press the key that represents the F sharp note on the E string and then play that note. Because the note will only sound if that specific string is being bowed as well. So we should only play the F sharp note if the F sharp position on the E string is being held down and there is currently an up bow or a down bow on the E string. To deal with this, we first create a held note stream, which is just our pressed key stream filtered to only include keys that represent notes. Then we combine both the up or down bow stream, which represents an up or down bow being held, and the held note stream, which represents which notes are currently being held. Now we check which string is being bowed and the notes that are being held for that string. But we don't want to just play all of the notes that are being held because on a real violin, the only thing that matters is the highest note that is being held on that string. The rest makes no difference. So we create this ordered notes array to determine the highest note being held on the string being bowed, and we either play that, or if no notes are being held, we play the open string note. But now we have yet another problem. What we have here mostly works. We are only playing the highest note, but as we just discussed, Anything that is happening above the highest note being held on a string makes no difference to the tone being produced. If I am pressing down F sharp and G sharp on the E string, it should only play G sharp. We are already doing this correctly. However, if I release the F sharp, it is going to cause our pressed keys to change, which will cause our stream to emit. And since our stream is emitting again, it will stop playing the current note and play the new note. This new note will still be G sharp, but the problem is that pressing and releasing F sharp should make no difference to the tone, but it will cause the G sharp tone to stop and start. To fix this, we can pull in yet another RxJS operator, pairwise. Now rather than our stream emitting just the current value, it will emit the current value paired with the previous value that was emitted on the stream. I won't go through how all of this code here works specifically because it is mostly just imperative logic and it could probably be improved anyway. But the idea is that rather than just determining the highest note for the current emission on the stream, we also calculate the highest note for the previous emission. If they are the same, we do not stop playing the current note. If they are different, then we do stop playing the current note. There is even more I intend to add to this. Uh, for example, it is also possible to play double stops on the violin, which is where you play two strings at the same time. I'm sure we could even add support for vibrato as well, and who knows, maybe even get really fancy with harmonics or something. But I think that will do for now. Mostly what I hope this video has demonstrated is how powerful and flexible RxJS is. I often see this sentiment that RxJS is complex and hard to maintain, especially as more requirements are added to the project. My point of view is pretty much the exact opposite. I find RxJS preferable for even basic scenarios, but it becomes invaluable as complexity ramps up and there are more moving parts to deal with. RxJS does not add complexity, it adds order to an otherwise chaotic situation. It deals with complexity up front, which is otherwise spread out through an application or ignored entirely, resulting in bugs and race conditions. This code here is not complex because we are using RxJS. It's complex because the situation is complex and RxJS is handling that complexity. I haven't tried building this violin without RxJS and frankly I don't want to, but I'm willing to bet this code would not be anywhere near as easy to understand or maintain as this is. If anyone is willing to build a non-RxJS version of this code, that would be great to see in the comments. And if you like this video, please consider a like or subscribe before you go, and I hope to see you back here again.